this short video, I'm going to set out 10 logical fallacies. A logical fallacy is defined as an error in reasoning or a faulty inference in an argument or an argument that is constructed wrongly. I'm setting them out here because these fallacies are now so common in the media and in the way government and business talks to the population that it's really important to know what they are. After I go through them, I'm then going to play a section of a recent stream I did called The Alchemy of Truth. I'm just going to play it because in that, in that stream, I showed that an article published by a so-called expert was beginning to end made up entirely of fallacies. So I'm going to set out the fallacies here and I'm going to put them on the screen so you can follow. So you will be able to first apply them to that article. Uh, that I dissected, and uh, then you can use these generally. So here we go. First, first, the straw man fallacy. The straw man fallacy is misrepresenting the position of the opponent. This is done by replacing their position with a different position, a straw man, and then attacking that different position. Changing the opponent's argument is called a straw man because a man made of straw is a weaker version of a man, which is easier to defeat. This fallacy sets up an easy and false version of the opponent's argument and then knocks that down or argues against that false position. Meanwhile, the actual argument of the opponent hasn't been addressed at all. Arguments cannot be constructed under these fallacious conditions because the subject of the argument itself isn't actually being addressed. Example, Mary says this is the best Thai food restaurant in the city. John responds, you think this is the best restaurant in the city? How to avoid the straw man fallacy. Make sure that you understand your opponent's position clearly. Restate it to the opponent and ask if what you stated is an accurate representation of their argument's position. This will also prevent against them changing their position later on. Two, begging the question, circular reasoning fallacy. Begging the question occurs when someone restates or reaffirms the premise or premises as the conclusion without any further explanation or information. The problem with this fallacy is that it never progresses the argument past the premise. The premises are simply reasserted as the conclusion or the conclusion is put into the premises and then reasserted as the conclusion. The premise of an argument has to be different in content and meaning than the conclusion, and the conclusion has to be separate in content and meaning than the premise, albeit, uh, albeit related through logical coherence. Example, Mary says, John always tells the truth. Bob asks, how do you know? Mary responds, because John says he always tells the truth. Of course, John's honesty is what's in question, and John speaking on his own behalf begs the question. This fallacy is circular, because the conclusion is really just the premise restated. How to avoid begging the question. Make sure that the conclusion isn't just restating the premise or one of the premises. This means thinking about and comparing the premise and conclusion with each other. Three, ad hominem fallacy. Attacking the person and not their argument. One manifestation of this argument fallacy is saying that the identity of a person disqualifies them from making or engaging in the argument itself. It's attacking a person, such as their identity or character, instead of attacking their actual position in the argument. Example 1. Cliff cannot be correct when he says that squares have right angles because he is a bad person and has been known to steal ideas and credit them for himself. The position that squares have right angles or not has been left untouched by this fallacy. You can see this playing out in the political spheres in modern American politics. How to avoid the ad hominem fallacy. Make sure that you're not attacking the person and you're actually contending with the content of their argument. Leave out any personal biases or irrelevant personal characteristics of the opponent that have nothing to do with the content of the argument. A person can be a bad person in any number of ways and still be logically correct in any given instance. 4. Post hoc fallacy. Post hoc ergo proctor hoc. After this, therefore, because of this fallacy. 
assuming causality from order of events, claiming that since B always happens after A, then A must cause B is the fallacy. Order of events doesn't mean causation necessarily. Actual causation would remain unexplained by only attending to the sequence or order of events. The sequence of events needs actual causation to be understood in order for causation claims to be made. Example, incidents of burglars breaking into cars rises whenever the sun is shining and declines when it's raining outside. Therefore, sunny days cause crime. How to avoid the post hoc fallacy. The best way to avoid this is to think about whether you actually understand the causal agent or causal story and that you're not inferring causation from the order of events. If you realize that you don't know the cause of the phenomena, it's best to just suspend judgments until the cause is known. 5. Loaded question fallacy. This fallacy occurs whenever a person asks a question which includes their desired outcome against the position of the person answering the question. Example. The classic example of a loaded question is, are you still beating your wife? Whether the person answers yes or no, the person is still framed as a wife beater, whether they are, are or not. This is also a tactic often used by lawyers when they're leading the witness by asking questions to guide the witness to certain conclusions that the lawyer is trying to attain. Another good one would be, how fast were you going when you went through the red light? That's another good one. How to avoid the loaded question fallacy. This should be easy to avoid since it, usually, it's, it is usually done intentionally and not by accident. Six, false dichotomy, false dilemma, either or fallacy. A false dichotomy is when the arguer is presenting only two possible options or outcomes to a position, when in reality there are more live options. It's done to narrow the opponent's position to only two possible outcomes. It's an argument tactic designed to lead narrowed and specific options. Example, mom tells her child, do you want to go to sleep now or in five minutes? The false dilemma is that there are, there are more options than now or in five minutes, such as going to bed in 10 minutes. Most kids pick up on this tactic used by parents when they're still in toddlerhood. How to avoid the false dilemma fallacy. Think about whether the options you're considering do indeed exhaust all of the possibilities, or if there are other legitimate possibilities to consider as well. Think about alternatives before the list of possibilities is narrowed to only one or two. Or two or one. Seven, equivocation, doublespeak fallacy. To equivocate means to use language in a wrong or misleading way, to either conceal a truth or to avoid being committed to a position. The goal behind this fallacy is to mislead the listener through a manipulation of language. Often the meaning of a word is changed mid-argument to serve the purpose of one who is being misleading. Equivocate is to make an incorrect equivalence between words or concepts that are at issue within the argument. Example. An example of equivocating would be to use the word right in two ways within an argument. Right as in morally correct and right as in functionally correct, such as the right tool to use for the job. How to avoid equivalency, equivocation fallacy. Use your words in consistent ways without shifting meanings. Eight, appeal to authority, ad vericundiam fallacy. A good example of that would be trust the science. Making an appeal to an authority in an argument doesn't make the argument correct. An appeal to authority can be correct or incorrect depending on the substance of the claim that is, that's at issue. There are experts, authorities, on opposing sides of court cases. They can both be right in certain domains or within the same domain. One can be more correct than the other. Being an expert on a given topic doesn't mean that anything that the expert claims is therefore correct. Example, Mary says the earth is flat. Bob says, how do you know that? Mary says, because my geology teacher told me. It's doubtful that a geology teacher would actually teach this, but it illustrates the fallacy. How to avoid the appeal to authority fallacy. Don't appeal to any authority as the basis for the legitimacy of your claim. Nine, hasty generalization fallacy. Making a claim about something without sufficient or unbiased evidence for the claim. 
If the evidence did support the claim, then it wouldn't be called a hasty generalization. It would be just a generalization. The hasty description means that the generalization was done too quickly and without evidence. This is a tricky one because there is no agreed upon threshold of what constitutes a sufficient number of examples or sample size to be considered as legitimate evidence of any given case, in any given case. Is it more than 50%? However, it can usually be more easily determined as to what constitutes biased or unbiased evidence. Example, John says, you're a musician, so therefore you must not have stage fright. How to avoid the hasty generalization fallacy? Consider what the evidence is and how large the sample size is and whether they're sufficient to be representative of the whole before making a claim or statement. 10. Appeal to popular opinion, ad populum fallacy, making an argument that a position is true or has validity because a great number or the majority of people hold to that position. The fallacy here is that the majority may be factually wrong as a result of being misled or having partial information and drawing wrong conclusions. We've seen this in history, in which the majority of people have been misled by their media or by their government or by wrong scientific or philosophical assumptions. I'm surprised uh, this one is still on the internet. Example, medieval John says the sun revolves around the earth and the earth is fixed in place. Medieval Mary says, how do you know that the sun revolves around a fixed earth? To which medieval John replies, don't you know that everyone believes that the earth is fixed in place around which the sun revolves? It's common knowledge. How to avoid the appeal to popular opinion fallacy? Consider the merits of the statements on their own grounds without recourse to what others think about it. So literally, this article is, has only one purpose that's to trick you. I'm not commenting on whether she's, her underlying premise is correct at all. I'm just looking at method, rhetoric, okay? So this lady, Abby Hafer, writes, in the name of truckers, public health laws, and the sorry history of modern anti-vaccine movements. She writes, the recently ended protests in Ottawa and elsewhere were supposedly done in the name of truckers, though very few actual truckers were involved. So first of all, she's saying basically there are no truckers here. That's not a fallacy of reason. That's a statement of fact. So she's got a little bit of truth here. Well, I'm not saying it's truth. I'm saying it's not a fallacy of reason in itself. But let's go on. The protest started in Vancouver with a few drivers who didn't want to be vaccinated in order to cross into the United States. Well, first of all, they didn't want to be vaccinated with a specific vaccine, okay? And this is a trick she uses through the whole article. Um, she uses kind of the straw man. So really, it's about one vaccine, but she continuously refers to all vaccines, which makes a big difference. Within days, however, general purpose anti-vaxxers and far-right activists had hijacked the protest. Stop. That is ad hominem attack. She's using, these are slurs, like anti-vaxxer, far-right activists. So she's using ad hominem attack, attack the person. And the basic premise there is, uh, these people are so bad they shouldn't be listened to. The Canadian Trucking Association was quick to point out that a minuscule percentage of the protesters were actually truckers. There were perhaps a few hundred trucks at the height of the protests, but there are more than 500,000 working trucks in Canada. Thus, the majority of the protesters were not truckers and the majority of truckers were not protesters. Well, you know, that, that's all very interesting, but the issue is whether they're right whether you know, they have, a, one, a basis to oppose the mandates um, and a basis to be um, concerned about the specific vaccine, okay? However, big trucks make lovely photo opportunities and are a picturesque way of allowing movement right work movement right-wingers and anti-vaccine activists to pretend that they are interested in helping working people. So again, ad hominem attacks. These people are all fake. The protest started with a single agenda item, opposing to, opposition to legally required vaccination under COVID-19. Okay. As such, they are the latest in a long, unfortunate history of the modern anti-vaccine movement. This being the case, 
it is worth taking a look at the irrational, illogical, unscientific, and frankly fraudulent history of the movement. She then talks about the um, another vaccine, the the modern anti-vaccination movement started in 1998 with the publication of an article titled I, I blah 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 non-specific blah 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 and pervasive developmental disorder in children this article was published in the british medical journal of the lancet it goes on the, the first author andrew wakefield had 12 co-authors the article suggested that the mmr measles mumps and rubella vaccine could lead to pervasive developmental disorder and behavioral regression in children. Most pervasive developmental disorders are considered to be on the autism spectrum. Now, this was proven to be a fraud. Of course, the truckers were not protesting the, the MMR vaccine. This is a straw man. She's laying out a fraudulent vax, anti-vax claim, right? and then attacking that, right? So presumably you would think, since this lady's a biologist, she's going to get to the actual vaccine that they were protesting. So she's she rips apart this attack on the MMR, right? And here at the beginning of the second page, she's going on about the MMR, right? Okay. And then... She goes on and on, paragraphs one, paragraph two of page two here. And finally, conclusion, uh, this guy Wakefield had committed a deliberate fraud. Okay, so we're now through halfway through page two. She still hasn't talked about what the truckers were talking about. And it goes on, right? So this, so just she's going to get back to the truckers in a second, but this is what she says, the last paragraph on this MMR thing. Wakefield may well go down in history as one of the worst and most dangerous of scientific frauds as a result of his scarring people about scaring people about vaccines childhood vaccination rates declined thereby exposing innocent children and the adults they they become to unnecessary risks and complications from disease and now in the era of COVID-19 Wakefield's fraudulently begotten movement is killing more people than ever for no scientifically valid reason. So this is an a, this is a straw man. She sets up the worst case of, of fraud she can find. It may well be. Of course, I'm not commenting on whether that fraud is it's legitimately called a fraud or not, but she's using this, this, this case, right, to say that these these Ottawa protesters are basically these fraudsters and they're about to do the same thing. Well, this isn't the issue. It's a total straw man. And this is where it really gets neat, which brings us back. Well, I'm glad she's back to the point, which is why these truckers, these Ottawa protests were so terrible, which brings us back to those protesters. They base their objections to vaccines on no solid science. First, she uses the plural here, vaccines. No, no, we're talking about a specific one, the COOF whatever you want to call it, okay, on no solid science. So obviously now she's going to talk about why she says that. No. But further, even beyond the specifics of the vaccine, the process, so, so this is an example of just stating your conclusion, restating your conclusion. So this was a bogus protest for no scientifically legitimate reason because there's no solid science. So this is, she just simply restates the proposition.